Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm going to be talking about uh, something that appears to be unrelated to the critical care topic, but it's actually very related to your daily activities because it has to do to clinical trials. Uh, I'm no longer the neuro ICU director, that uh, a job now is in the better hands of Dr. Jonathan Radcliffe, so focusing my career really in the neuroendovascular treatment now. And um, what I want to tell you, it's, it's a story uh, that actually happened at our hospital in relation to two large randomized clinical trials that uh, we've done over the last uh, uh, several years, uh, where some of the principles of equipoise and, and social value and social cost and social benefit uh, became very clear to us. So I kind of want to share this story to help you uh, uh, coping uh, with some of the uncertainties and ethical challenges that you have uh, during the execution of clinical trials potentially in the ICU. Here are my disclosures. So, randomized clinical trials are undoubt undoubtedly the, the best source uh, of evidence for safety and efficacy of any interventional treatment in medicine. There are, the, the problem with the randomized clinical trial is there is a need Right, for a control group, and that control group is theoretically being deprived from a treatment that could perhaps uh, be beneficial to this patient. So when that treatment is new, that it's not perceived as a loss, it's perceived as a potential gain or even a risk. But when that treatment has already been incorporated in clinical practice through non-randomized evidence, but that evidence is put in question, and there is a need then to validate that therapy that is perceived as a loss. And uh, that's a, a problem that you had in mechanical thrombectomy and that may be the case for many of the things you have to do in the ICU. I guess it's probably even more common, right, because we start practicing things uh, without all the evidence that you need and then that practice is put in question. And then you have to do a randomized clinical trial where you have to remove something you have been doing and you believe helps patients. So, in that setting, I think there are two important principles, uh, of course, is the principle of uh, clinical equipoise, where the patients can't be dis clearly disadvantaged by enrolling them in a trial. One thing is for me to believe that treatment is beneficial for you, the other thing is the whole medical community. The other thing is that the principle of societal value, Okay, so the studies that don't have any benefit to generate a societal value are generally considered unethical, specifically if there is any, any possibility of risks. So this is a trial that I participate in, and in this trial what we're doing is for patients that had strokes or TIAs and had intracranial stenosis related to atherosclerosis, we would put a stent or you would just treat with medical treatment. And there was so much evidence in the coronary literature that treating atherosclerotic disease with stents was beneficial, right? We felt that putting patients in this trial would be potentially depriving them from a treatment. It turned out that at the end of the trial you were hurting patients with this treatment. So again, it highlights that until you have the level 1 A evidence, you don't really know. So our objective here was to calculate mathematically the social value of these two thrombectomy trials. The first trial was an early window trial, zero to six hours. This, the, the second trial was a trial that will attempt to expand this uh, window to six to 24 hours. Both trials turned out to be successful. So what you did here is we performed a retrospective analysis looking at all thrombectomy cases that you did uh, at Brady Hospital between March 2012 and October 2018. We had then these two trials. Uh, in the SWIFT Prime trial, we enrolled 13 patients, out of which six went to controls and seven were treated. And this happened over the course of 11 months. We then analyzed the subsequent uh, 44 months to the trial. In the down trial, we enrolled 38 patients, including 16 controls and 22 patients that were treated to thrombectomies. And that was over the course of 26 months. 
We then analyze the period of the 36 months preceding the trial with the and compare with the period of 70 months following the trial. Uh, this is just a graph to demonstrate that overall the pre- and post-trial periods were very similar in terms of demographics and clinical outcomes for both trials. So here is the first trial. Okay, so the first trial, and I think this is what really helps us understand this concept of social value. So the first trial was positive with a number need to treat of just 2.6. This is actually uh, is, uh, 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 even more uh, um, beneficial than antibiotic in sepsis, right? The number need to treat that is typically around four. So it was a highly positive trial. And we had 13 patients that were enrolled, six were in the control, and three were treated. So in the first scenario, okay, if we had enrolled, not enrolled these patients, so no randomized clinical trial, out of 13 patients, five would have benefit. In the second scenario here, when you put the patient in the trial, you had six patients that went to the control arm, and you had seven patients that went to the treatment arm. Because some of the patients when you control, they are not going to see a benefit. But you have to understand that not all control patients are deprived from treatment because the number that you treat is never one, right? So even in a situation like this, by randomizing patients, we benefit 2.7 out of the 13. So retrospectively, we deprive 2.3 patients to have uh, a benefit of at least one point in the disability scale over an 11 month period. So this is the price that you pay or the patient sacrifice, although it's not a real sacrifice because you didn't know they would benefit for sure. Well, the other way to look at benefit uh, in thrombectomy is look at the patients that go back to full independence. The first number I showed to you was any, uh, dis uh, any benefit in disability scale. This is another way, perhaps a bit uh, uh, more conservative, okay? But these are the patients that will go almost back to normal. So the number you need to treat in that case is four, which again, very, very low. Um, and if you don't do a randomized clinical trial, and those 13 patients uh, have been treated, 3.25 of 3.25 patients would have benefit. When you do the randomized clinical trial, the six patients in the control group don't see a benefit, but again, the number you should treat is not one. And then you apply the ratio of NNT of four to the seven treated patients, we're gonna have 1.75 patients benefiting. So retrospectively, you deprived 1.5 patients from being independent at 90 days over the course of 11 months. So that's again, the price that you pay. So what do you gain by doing this? When you acquire evidence, your volumes go up because now you have a proven therapy. You feel more comfortable talking to the families. You feel more comfortable talking to your referring physicians. You feel more comfortable offering that therapy that now has been proved in the in a setting of randomized clinical trial. And here what you can see is the pre and post randomized clinical trial thrombectomy volumes in, in terms of monthly rate in our center went from 13.9 um, thrombectomies monthly to 23.5 thrombectomy monthly after this trial. Very likely purely as a consequence of the data. So on average, we uh, start treating 9.6 additional patients every month, okay? So with that, we had less disability of 3.7 additional patients every month, and you could give an independent outcome to an additional two or four patients every month. So here is uh, the, the less disabled patient in 90 days. So again, 2.3 additional month and 1.5 additional month. So the long story is it took less than one month to overcome any retrospective patient sacrifice that you did by enrolling the patient in the trial. So those patients that were retrospectively deprived from the treatment that you didn't even know it was beneficial, 
in the course of a month you can make up for that just because you now have better level of evidence. And in the down trial, things are not very different. This is 6 uh, to 24 hours. And in this trial, we actually had the lowest number in each to treat you have seen in stroke therapy. That number in each to treat was just two. So two patients have to be treated in order to have one additional patient with less degree of disability. We enrolled 38 patients at Grady, were the second largest enrolled in this trial. <clears throat> and 16 were in the control. So, if you had treated all 38 patients, 19 of these patients would have benefited by having 16 controls, not all of the patients you benefit, of course, none of the controls you benefit, and only 11 of the treatment you benefit. So, retrospectively, you deprived 8 patients from having less disability over the course of 26 months. When you apply the other way of looking at outcomes, which is uh, a functional independence, again, being almost back to normal, again, the number in each you treat here is slightly higher, 2.8. If you didn't do a randomized clinical trial, 13.6 patients would have been benefited out of this 38. By enrolling patients in the trial, we benefit 7.9 patients, so you deprived just short of six patients um, from having a functional outcome that was uh, nearly normal. But then what happened afterwards, because we have better evidence, we're now offering more treatment to more patients, and on average we were treating almost four patients additionally every month, and by doing that, almost two patients had less disability every month, and almost one and a half patients had a good functional outcome or near independence every month. So when you do the calculations here, very similarly, we can actually do this math and see that over a short period that took less than five months, you could compensate this retrospective sacrifice to these patients. So what these calculations essentially are doing for us is it's helping us coping with the fact that you were depriving a treatment from certain people, for certain people, but we we're doing so in the setting of equipoise. And just going back to that first trial that I demonstrate, very often some of these treatments that you do that are not proven, that have not yet been through the scrutiny of a randomized clinical trial, they can, uh, number one, be expensive, but even worse, they can be risky and they may actually be hurting patients. But even again, in the setting of highly positive tribes, right, number one you should treat between two and four is essentially what you're talking about here. It shows that the benefits to society are so great that over the course of a very short period, you make up for any loss in the treatment uh, of the patients that went for the control group. And here is essentially a graph representing how much you can actually you know, you have plateau in your practices or even drops in your practice related to generation of new competing centers. But when then you acquire new evidence through randomized clinical trials, you have these spikes in clinical volumes and again the second spike from the second trial. So these trials really help expanding uh, our understanding uh, about the disease process, making sure that you are treating the right group of patients. Uh, there are limitations here, this is a retrospective study, and this was conducted in a, a well-established comprehensive center that had kind of an aggressive outreach approach and a cutting-edge uh, treatment philosophy. So what that means is probably we are underestimating the impact of these trials because you are already very aggressive with treatment. People that actually require greater degree of evidence probably uh, gain even more from these trials. So to conclude, our start demonstrates that a highly promising treatment such as mechanical thrombectomy in this case, the ethical dilemma of depriving control patients from active treatment during the execution of a well-designed randomized clinical trial is actually dramatically offset by the result and the proven benefit to the much larger group of patients that you'll be able then to subsequently treat once you have the ultimate proof of a benefit. Thus, the local and societal benefit after a scientific breakthrough as defined in randomized clinical trial vastly surpass 
the potential burden to the relatively few control patients that were left untreated in face of prior equipoise. Thank you very much for your attention. Questions? And thank you. I think you know, that was very helpful and a great way to, to talk about the rationale of why we do uh, randomized control trials and clinical research in, in general. Um, could you speak about the, the effect of delayed knowledge uptake or the inconsistent application of that, both at the study centers and at, at other medical centers, on your estimates? So, one, um, if I go back to those graphs, uh, you see that uh, uh, there is definitely the possibility that over time things just grow, right? So, but what you see here is that these numbers actually, they got pretty stable over the course of long period of times. So you almost reach a plateau. So that actually happens, uh, and I think it varies across different realities. In our case, because it's a relatively small field, uh, uh, large vessel cruising stroke and thrombectomy, and you have a very aggressive outreach program. So we feel that you had already maximized uh, maximize our uptake of patients and it was really the lack of evidence that was depriving us access to more patients but it, it is one of the potential limitations of, the, uh, uh, of these calculations is chances are things will grow over time anyways right but we see these clear spikes after the generation of evidence and uh, I, I apologize for the, 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 it's a little bit of a complex way of looking at this problem, like doing all these different calculations. Uh, but uh, the idea here was we all feel bad when a patient goes to a control group, right, in a randomized clinical trial where you believe there is a benefit. And first one, belief is not proof, right? Belief is not proof of anything. Secondly, oftentimes we are wrong, as I showed in the first trial. So you are actually helping people by depriving them on something that could harm them and is expensive. But third is, even if you see that as a sacrifice, which is not, it's kind of a dramatic way of pulling things, it's not a real sacrifice because you just don't know. And for society as a whole, it pays off because those few control patients are generating the type of data that will change the lives of many, many more patients. We have other questions? Yeah, a quick question. Um, how, how many of the people in the control group passed away? Do you have that information? How many? How many people that were in the control group passed away? Pass? Who died. Oh, okay. So the mortality in these trials, um, um, it's, it's around 20%, okay? But the problem with stroke actually, there has been only one trial. We have about, we have close to 10 trials now, and stroke trials for thrombectomy, they are typically not very big. They range between um, 200 and 500 patients, it's not like cardiology where I have the two, 3,000. But there is only one trial that show a mortality benefit. Okay, so different than sepsis uh, and MI, uh, stroke typically doesn't kill, which is actually the worst thing about it, because the worst fate after a stroke is not death. It's actually being bad reading, continent, depending on your family and with a terrible quality of life. So that's why you have to adjust your endpoints accordingly. So that's why you talk about disability, shift to have less disability, and have like a home run being again completely independent. So that's why I get those two numbers, which may have made things a little harder to follow, but that's just the way you measure the benefit. Okay. It's really interesting to think about the social value of trials, right? We don't have to <laughs> think about that. Yeah, we, we actually were trying to find some some other type of work where you could apply the principles uh, to this and you were not able to find anything like that. Yeah. And you typically don't think about, uh, we, we think about cost effectiveness, right, in terms of money, but there is also cost effectiveness in terms of how our patients feel in relation to research and how society should feel in relation to research. So that's what you try to do.